We'll start this one by asking a simple question of, does gas A or gas B have a greater temperature? Go ahead and pause, come right back. This one should be quick and simple. Gas B will have a greater temperature. When you have all your particles lined up, you're gonna see that this is a lower pressure. Right? Everyone's moving in the same direction or about the same direction. And that reduces the overall temperature of the system. Remember, temperature, from our astronomical, our physicist perspective. Temperature is just the random motion and the average speed of these particles. So when they're going in the random directions, that is going to up our temperature. These will be hotter objects. The reason we ask about these gases, the way they're moving and the temperatures, is that it tells us a pattern of what we can see in the planets. Notice that the rocky planets are all closer to the sun, or as we see our gas giants out past our asteroid belt. Why is that? Well, think about how hot these things are. Not due to the proximity to the sun. Yes, the solar power from the sun does keep these planets hotter than their distant counterparts, the giants. But go back to that nebulous idea, that giant cloud collapsing down. The gravitational potential energy of Mercury or Venus that gas started way up here and fell all the way down. So that gravitational energy was converted into the greatest amount of kinetic and eventually thermal energy. So the atmospheres of the rocky planets were very hot. So hot, in fact, that the gases there were above the escape speeds necessary. So the atmospheres especially the hydrogen aspects of the rocky planets, were so energetic that they just flew off, flew away. And the remaining material in the solar system would fall into, say, the gas giants and their own corresponding accretion disks. So we see, we see the moons around all the, diff all the different planets. The planets will have their own corresponding accretion disk, and that material, if it didn't fall into the planet, would coalesce into a corresponding moon. And this concept about chemical condensation is to try and explain the range of substances, uh, uh, compounds that you see throughout the solar system. And so these temperatures here refer to the temperatures of the uh, accretion disk uh, before the planets were forming. And what are you going to find there? Well, depending on the temperature in that region of space depends on what can condense. So way out here near the gas giants, that's where you're going to find ices like water, ammonia, and methane. Those temperatures allow those things to cool off enough and form into solid ices. Now we start going up the scale. Let's jump to the other side where we see these metal oxides. Think about the temperatures here. It's so hot that water it's going to be vapor. It's going to be a gas. The water can never condense in this region. It'll just be too interject. It'll always be flying around there or as a gas. And this is what we mean when we talk about the chemical condensation. As you are closer to the sun, closer to, at that point, the protostar, you're going to have a greater temperature, which means that you're going to need higher, more complex elements that can condense, turn into solids. As the temperature goes down, as you go further and further away, different things can chemically condense down into solids, turn into ices is another term we'll use throughout the semester. And you'll have your ices that form at these different ranges. So this band of where things can turn into a solid based on the temperature helps explain the composition materials that we see throughout the solar system. Now slicing into the interior of the gas planets, we're actually going to dispel a common myth and that the gas planets do have solid parts to them. They do have solid cores of rocks and ice. Now, we'll probably never land anything on that solid parts because any satellite we send up here will have to go through this deep layers of atmosphere and the pressure will become so intense that it's highly unlikely that any robot that we could ever build could sustain the pressures to finally land on those rocky cores. So the name gas giant 
It was popularized in around the 1950s, and it just refers to, well, the big gaseous atmospheres. The thing about the gaseous plants is that their temperatures are cool enough that these outer layers can't float away. They're not above the escape velocities uh, compared to, say, the rocky planets closer to the sun. Let's go through this in a bit more detail. So our Jupiter, you've got that core, rock and some ices, surrounded by a metallic hydrogen layer. What I mean by metallic hydrogen is that electricity can conduct through this. Charge can flow through this material. Now hydrogen normally is not a electrical conductor, but because of the amount of pressure squeezing this stuff, the physical properties of that hydrogen is being altered, thus allowing it to conduct charge. Just outside of that, you'll have what we call molecular hydrogen, basically H2. These are forming chemical bonds holding hydrogens together. And outside of that, that'll be your upper layer atmospheres. Once again, mostly hydrogen. Saturn has basically the same patterns. Uh, we're not looking at the rings of Saturn. That'll be a discussion in future videos. While Uranus and Neptune have a slightly different aspects. They'll have their rocky cores, but they'll be surrounded by this mantle of ammonia, methane, some water. But these will all be ices. Right? They are so cold that they're frozen solid. We might even talk about things of uh, tectonics there, but that's all speculation. Outside of this mantle and Uranus and Neptune, you'll have this hydrogen, helium, and methane gas in that atmosphere. Jupiter, being the most massive planet in our solar system, has a mass of 1.9 times 10 to the 27 kilograms. Now, in terms of this range of scales, if Jupiter was about 13 times more massive, it would have had enough mass to reach that critical density to start nuclear fusion in the core. And that's our definition of a star, where you are fusing protons together into heavier elements. So some people might refer to Jupiter as a failed star, or just a giant gas planet. So that's your range here. Right? Here's our Earth perspective, Jupiter. Multiply that by 13 times, and you'll start to get something like a low-mass star. In between this, between a gas giant and a star, there are the brown dwarfs, also known as substellar objects. They're just not quite stars yet, but they are close. If they were a little bit more massive, you would get a fusion of hydrogen out there.